Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about concavity. And concavity is a way to describe if a function is curving upward or downward. And so let's start by looking at the first category of concavity, which is concave upward. And we like to shorten it by calling it concave up. And I will commonly denote it by writing CON, which stands for concave, and then a little arrow pointing up. So that would mean concave up. And so what concavity really is, it's the measurement of the change of our slope. And so let's take a look at our first function here by picking a few points on the function. So let's pick a point, let's say right here, right here, and right here. And then let's look at the slope at each one of these points here. And so let's start with this point. If we were to draw a tangent line at that point, which will allow us to easily see what the slope is at that point, it'll look a little bit like this. And then we'll draw a tangent line at our next point here, and then we'll draw one more for our final point. And so what we notice with each one of these tangent lines, which again is representing the slope at that particular point on this function, is with each point as we go along the x-axis, the slope is getting larger. And so what I mean by that is that this would be a negative slope here, right? It's pointing downward in the y direction, right? As we go from left to right, it is pointing downward in the y direction. And then we change to a positive slope. We are going upward in the y direction. And then in our third point, we're looking at a steeper slope, right? This is a little bit steeper. It's pointing more upwards than this point. And so our slope is greater at this point than it is here. And so as we go along this line with each point, our slope is slowly increasing over time. And this would be true for all the points in between these points as well. The slope at a point right here would be greater than the slope here, but less than this slope. And the slope of a point right here would be greater than this slope, but less than this slope. And so what we would say in this case is that the slope or the first derivative is increasing in this case. And so then let's look at the second category for concavity, which is concave downward, which we call concave down, or I will write it as CON, meaning concave, and then an arrow pointing down for downward. So this would mean concave down. And this function here represents a function that is concave downward. And so if we do the same thing that we did for this graph, where we pick a few points on this function, so I'll pick one right here, right here, and right here, then we can also analyze the slope at those points. And so I'll start by drawing one at this point, and then I'll draw one at this point, and then draw one on our last point, and now we can analyze the slope at each one of these points. And what we'll see here is that the slope on our first point is slightly positive, and then the slope at the next point is negative, and then the slope at our next point is even more negative. It's a steeper line, right? This is closer to being a horizontal line than this line is. And so this would have a smaller slope or a slope that is greater in the negative direction than this point here. And so what we find for a function when it is concave downward is that the slope is decreasing as we go further along the function. And so in this case, the first derivative or the slope of the function is decreasing when our function is concave downward. And so if you remember when we discussed increasing and decreasing functions, we used the first derivative to describe the change or the slope of the function. Well, concavity is a similar idea, but instead of describing how the function is increasing or decreasing, we are describing how the first derivative or the slope is increasing or decreasing. And so that's actually the second derivative of our function, right? If the first derivative determines whether a function is increasing or decreasing, then the second derivative would determine if the first derivative is increasing or decreasing. And so what we find here is that if our first derivative is increasing, then our second derivative, f double prime of x, is going to be positive, right? If our first derivative is increasing, then the rate at which that is changing is going to be positive. And then the opposite is true for concave downward, where the second derivative of the function would be negative because the slope is decreasing. And so just like we use the first derivative to determine whether a function is increasing or decreasing, we can use the second derivative to determine whether the slope is increasing or decreasing, which ultimately translates to this idea of concavity or whether a function is concave up or concave down. And so let's look at some functions visually on a graph and see where they would be concave upward and where they would be concave downward. And so here we have two functions that we're gonna look at here, and we're gonna determine where each of these functions are concave upward and concave downward. And just a quick reminder, when a function was concave up, it was shaped like this, and when it was concave down, it was shaped like this. And so a quick little trick to determine if a function is concave up or concave down is to look at the direction at which the arrows are pointing, right? In this case, they are pointing in the upward direction, 
And then in this case, they're pointing in a downward direction. So we have concave up and concave down. And so if we apply that to our example here with this function, let's see where on this function we would have curves that are pointing upward and curves that are pointing and downward. And so let's start by just tracing the line of our function. So if we start on the leftmost side and we follow the curve here, we notice that we are curving upward and then around negative one, we start to switch directions in the way that we are curving. And then around positive one, we change the direction in which we are curving again. And so if you notice in this area, if we were to extend the line out this way, we would be pointing upward in this direction and we're already pointing upward in this direction. And so for this part of the function, for the values of x from negative infinity all the way to negative one, we are pointing in the upward direction. We have a curve that is concave upward. And so I'll write from negative infinity to negative one, our function is concave upward. But then what's going on from negative one to one? Well, now we are curving in a different direction, right? We were curving upward, now we're curving downward. And so from negative one to one, if you can imagine if we were to extend these lines here, that it would be pointing downward. And so from negative one to one, our function is concave downward. It is curving in the downward direction. And then the rest of our function from one to positive infinity, we are curving upward again. We switch directions from curving downward to upward. And so now from one to positive infinity, we are concave upward again. And so while we can look at this visually to determine that, do not forget that concavity is actually telling you whether the function's slope is increasing or decreasing. And so we said from this interval, our function is concave up. Well, hopefully you can see that as we go along this line, the slope is increasing up until this point right here, right? We'd have a negative slope coming in and then right around here, it's gonna switch to becoming greater and greater. And then at this point, our slope is switching to becoming less, right? It's gonna get smaller and smaller until it's zero right here. And then it will become negative until this point where it starts to get greater again until it is zero and then a positive slope once again. And so remember when your function is concave up, the slope is increasing. And when your function is concave downward, the slope is decreasing. And so then let's look at our second example here and see where this function is concave upward or concave downward. And if I follow this function from left to right, it looks like we are curving in a downward direction here up until this point, and then we are curving upward for the rest of the function, right? If we were to imagine that this function extended in these ways, can you kind of see how the different parts of this function are concave downward and concave upward? In fact, we could have done that for our other example. We could have drawn lines like this and you would be able to more easily see where your function is concave up and concave down and concave up again, right? It's all about how the function is curving. But if we go back to our second example here, we can see that our function is concave downward up until this point of x equals five and then it is concave upward from five to positive infinity. And so if we get rid of those imaginary lines that I drew, because they're not really there, I just drew those to kind of help you to see how this function is curving, we can say that from the values of negative infinity to five, our function is concave downward. And then from five to infinity or positive infinity, our function is concave upward. And so what that means is that from negative infinity to five on this area of our graph, our slope is decreasing, right? It's really steep here and it's slightly less steep here, slightly less steep here until we get to zero and then it becomes negative until this point right here where then the slope starts to increase again, right? We're slightly less negative until we get to where the slope is zero at this point right here. And then it starts to increase again with steeper and steeper positive slopes. And so here you can see the intervals of concavity for these functions graphically. And so notice that as we went through these examples, we were making note of these points, negative one, one, and then on this graph, five, where the concavity was changing. And we call these points, points of inflection. And so all that a point of inflection is, is just where the concavity changes on a function, whether it's changing from concave up to concave down, or from concave down to concave up, in either way, that point where that change happens is a point of inflection. And so the formal definition of an inflection point is the following. We have that if a point C and then the function output for that value of C, right? So we have an X value and a Y value. If that point is a point of inflection of the graph of a function F, then either the second derivative at that point is equal to zero or the second derivative does not exist at that value of C. And so the points of inflection that we have seen so far fall in the first category here where the second derivative at that point 
was equal to zero. And essentially what this means is that the slope at that point is not changing. We have a constant slope. If you think of a linear function where you just have a straight line that has no curves, the second derivative of that entire function is zero because every point has the same slope. The slope is not increasing or decreasing. And so then how about this second category where the second derivative does not exist at a point C? Well, here would be an example of a function where that is true. If you look at the shape of this function, we would have a point of inflection around right here. And that's because our slope is decreasing up until this point, and then it is increasing after that point, right? So we're concave downward over here, and then concave upward over here. So our concavity is switching or changing at this inflection point right there. But what is the slope of this inflection point? Well, the slope, if we were to draw a tangent line, would be a vertical line. And a vertical line doesn't have a slope. In fact, the slope is undefined for a vertical line. And so what we find here is that since the slope isn't defined, we don't know if the slope is increasing or decreasing. And so therefore, the second derivative also doesn't exist at that point. And so this would be an example of an inflection point where the second derivative does not exist at that point. And so while this isn't very common to see on a function, I thought I would at least show you because inflection points do happen at other points besides where the second derivative is equal to zero. And so then I want to show you with a different graph that just because the second derivative is equal to zero at a particular point, that it is not necessarily an inflection point. And so here we have the function f of x equals x to the fourth power, where at the value of x equals zero, our slope is not changing, right? It is not changing at that point. And so the second derivative would be equal to zero at this point. If we plugged a value of zero into the second derivative of this function, we would get zero. And so you would want to think that this would be an inflection point because the second derivative is equal to zero. But if you look at our function here, the entire function is concave upward. It never changes, right? It's concave upward up to x equals zero and it's concave upward after x equals zero. The concavity of this function does not change at that point. And so even though the second derivative is equal to zero, x equals zero is not a point of inflection. And so just keep that in mind, just because the second derivative is equal to zero for a particular point, it does not guarantee that it's an inflection point. And so you wanna keep that in mind when you are determining whether a point on a function is an inflection point or not. You're going to want to look at the concavity around that point. And you'll see what I mean by that when we get to our example at the end. And the last thing I wanna show you is with another graph of another function, and that is this function right here. We have f of x equals x squared plus one divided by x squared minus four. And on this function, you'll notice that we have a change in concavity, but we don't have inflection points. And so what I mean by that is if you look at this side of the function up until negative two, our function is concave upward, right? The slope is increasing for this part of the function. But then if you look at the values after negative two or on the other side of this asymptote, our function is concave downward. The slope is decreasing for this part of our function. And then after this asymptote of x equals two, the slope of our function is increasing again, and so we are concave upward. And so what we find here is that the concavity of our function changes at x equals negative two and x equals two, but there are no points that are defined at those values where the concavity concavity changes. And so in this case, although the concavity changes two times on this function, there are no inflection points that we can make a note of. And so the takeaway here is just because you don't have any inflection points does not necessarily mean that you do not have a change in concavity. You can still switch from concave up to concave down and then from concave down to concave up without having a specific point on that function where that change takes place. But do notice that although we don't have inflection points here, that we do have these vertical asymptotes where the function does not exist at those points. And so what's really happening here is that our function is switching concavity at points of discontinuity, right? Our function is not continuous at x equals negative two and x equals two. And so what we find here, what this all has been leading up to is that if we wanna find the intervals of concavity for a function, we need to either find points of inflection or we need to find where the function is not continuous. And so let's finally take a look at an example of how we would determine the intervals of concavity for a particular function without using its graph, meaning we're doing it purely analytically. And so here's our example. We have 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x plus eight. And we wanna determine the intervals where the given function is concave upward and concave downward. 
And so in order to do this, in order to determine the intervals where our function is concave up and concave down, we need to find the inflection points or the points where our function is not continuous and then look at the intervals around those points and analyze those. And so the first thing we wanna do is we wanna find the second derivative of our function because just by looking at this function right here, it is a polynomial, so it's not gonna have any values that are not continuous. And so we can forget about finding points of discontinuity and just worry about the second derivative for our function. So we'll start by taking the first derivative and then we'll take the derivative again to find the second derivative. And so f prime of x, the first derivative, will be equal to two times three, so we're gonna have six and then x to the second power if we subtract one from our exponent, and then minus six x using the power rule on this term, and then we'll have minus 12, which would be the derivative of negative 12x, and then the derivative of eight is just zero, so we don't need to write that. And so now we're ready to take the second derivative of our function. So we'll take the derivative of our first derivative to find that. And so we'll have that f double prime of x is equal to two times six. So we'll have 12 and then x to the first power minus six. And so now that we have our second derivative, what we're going to do is we're gonna set the second derivative equal to zero and then solve for x. And that's going to be our potential inflection point for this function. It is not for sure an inflection point until we check to see if the function is changing concavity at that point, but we'll get there. But let's just start by solving for the value of x where our second derivative is equal to zero. So we'll have zero is equal to 12x minus six. And if we add six to both sides, we'll have six equals 12x. And then dividing both sides by 12 will get us that x is equal to one half. And so this is going to be that potential x value where we might have an inflection point. And so if we draw a number line here, I'll label the one point that we have, one half, and now we'll see that we have two intervals that we're gonna be interested in for this function. We're gonna have all the values of x from negative infinity to one half, and then all the values from one half to positive infinity. And so our two intervals here are from negative infinity to one half, and then from one half to positive infinity. And so what we're gonna do here to test the concavity on these two intervals is to pick a value between the endpoints and then we'll plug it into our second derivative to see if our value is positive or negative. Because remember what we found at the beginning of the lesson. We found that if the second derivative is greater than zero or it's positive, then our function is concave upward. And if our second derivative is less than zero or it's negative, then our function is concave downward. And this also applies to intervals of a function. If we find that the value of the second derivative in a particular interval is greater than zero, or it's positive, then that interval for a function is concave upward. And if we found that the value of the second derivative on a particular interval is less than zero or negative, then the function is concave downward for that interval. All right, so if I pick a value between negative infinity and one half, I'm gonna pick zero. I think that's a good one to pick. We'll plug that into our second derivative and we'll see what we get. In this case, zero times 12 is zero, and then minus six, so we're just gonna have negative six, and so that is a negative value, so our slope is decreasing on that interval, so that means that our function is concave down on that interval. And now let's pick a value between one half and infinity. In this case, I'll pick one, so we'll have f double prime of one, and that's gonna be equal to one plugged into our second derivative, so one times 12 is 12, and then 12 minus six is six, so we're gonna have positive six here, and so that's a positive value for our second derivative, which means that our slope is increasing, which means that our function is concave upward on that interval. And so the concavity is changing around this point, and so now we can say that x equals one half is a point of inflection. If a concavity did not change, this would not be a point of inflection, but since it did, it went from concave down to concave up, it is. And if you wanted the full point, you could plug one half into your original function to get the full point. So if you wanted the full inflection point, I'll tell you that it is one half, three halves, right? So if you plug one half into this function, you'll get three halves, and so this would be your point of inflection for this function. But what we were trying to find for this example were the intervals where our given function is concave up and concave down, and so that is what we found right here. And so our answer in this case would be this right here. But I did just wanna make a note of the inflection point because sometimes you'll be asked just to find the inflection point. So it is important that you know how to determine if a point is an inflection point. All right, and so that's all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more examples, in fact, I'd highly encourage that you look at some more examples. I'll have an example video linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. 
So I will see you next time.